What's in your high school counseling starter pack? I've got 50 of your must-have Counselor Click resources ready for you to start your year off strong. Whether you're a new counselor hoping to build your toolkit, a veteran counselor wanting to spice things up in your program, or an experienced secondary school counselor who's found your footing but wants to add a little something new to your programming, this is for you. Grab the Back to School High School Counselor Bundle, which features 50 of my resources ready to go for you. From classroom lessons to small groups to data collection to career activities, I've got you covered. Go to counselorclick.com slash BTS bundle for 20% off of these resources today. Hello, my Counselor Click. I hope wherever you are in your summer months, wherever you find yourself right now, my hope is that you're feeling rested and rejuvenated. Maybe you need a vacation from your vacation at this point, or you're just ready to see your work colleagues again. I get that. If you went to ASCA a few weeks ago, I hope that you're still riding high from the energy and the momentum that that brought you. We're chatting about 10th graders today, and you'll get to hear from a high school counselor who loves this group. When you're done listening, I do have a couple of resources that I love using with sophomores, and I've listed those in the show notes, and you can always get those by going to the episode show notes. So this one you can find at counselorclick.com slash episode 138. That's this episode, or just check the show notes in your podcast player. You'll see all links for the sophomore year planning bundle, a healthy relationships lesson, and some career activities, since those are all kind of big topics that we talk about with sophomores in this episode. Today, I'm interviewing Hannah, who works with all grade levels, but has a specific passion for working with sophomores. I'll let her introduce herself and tell you why she loves them so much, here after we roll the intro. You got into this profession to make a difference in your students' lives, but you're spread thin by all of the things that keep getting added to your to-do list. I can't create more hours in the day, but I can invite you into my counselor click where you'll finally catch your breath. Come with me as we unpack creative ideas and effective strategies that'll help you be the counselor who leaves a lifelong impact on your students. I'm Lauren Tingle, your high school counseling hype girl, here to help you energize your school counseling program and remind you of how much you love your job. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to High School Counseling Conversations. I'm so glad you're here. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Will you give us a quick intro to who you are and the type of school you work at and how you work with 10th graders? Like what capacity? Yes. So my name is Hannah. I am a high school counselor and I work in Dallas, Georgia. And our high school is a public school. We do alpha split. So I have a certain part of the alphabet. So I have all grade levels, but this past year, especially, I've worked with of our 10th graders. And then the past three years, my first three years there, I did 10th grade as a grade level specifically. So I did all the 10th grade tasks with them. Okay, so you're di- you've always been divided by alpha, but like you, your assigned kind of responsibilities and tasks were like all the tenth grade things. Yes, like tenth grade, that. like Bridgeville, which I don't know is a Georgia thing. I'm not sure if other states do that, but yeah, basically all of the like grade level tasks okay. for tenth graders, like the PSAT and all that good stuff. That's cool because it's like when you're alpha split, somebody has to take the lead on certain tasks. So it kind of makes sense. That's a cool way of doing it. Like everyone still kind of has a grade level that maybe like they specialize in. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, there are other ways you can do it too. Like you take the things that you like, you maybe do less of the things that you don't like, but this is a great way. I think if you're maybe someone who's listening, who like it's their first time going from grade level to alpha split, like what a great way to like assimilate into that and make it work for your department. Yeah, for sure. It's worked really well for us thus far, I'd say, because we have five counselors. So basically one counselor is ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And then we have one that does eighth to ninth grade transition because that's a big thing too. Okay, cool. And then we recently did swap because we kind of are on a three-year rotation. So that way everybody learns kind of that grade level. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed 10th grade and it was kind of a nice place to start, I feel like. So that is actually where I started too. We were okay. strictly grade level counselors and I was okay. with 10th grade. So I'll be interested to see like if your perspective is similar to mine. What yeah. do you think from working with 10th graders? What do you think makes them unique and special? I think there's a lot of things. I think the most current group of 10th graders, I guess past couple ones, they were unique because they missed like almost all of middle school with COVID. 
And so I don't know about other people out there, but I feel like we saw a ton of like social emotional stuff just because as we all know, middle school is where you work out so much of those things. But I feel like also it's kind of a cool spot for them because they're not quite halfway through. So they're not in ninth grade, which is like the huge transition year where everything is new. They're trying to learn and adjust all these things. They've kind of, they've gotten that year. Now they're in their second year. And so they can, they still have a lot of big decisions in front of them, but they also have time to change maybe the direction they're going and to make some different decisions. So it's kind of nice because, you know, sometimes when you're working with 12th graders, it's kind of sad because there's only so much they can do when they're, they kind of have finally matured and you're like, well, you have one semester left. Right. So like you as a counselor feel like you can help them, like you can make an impact because they can still change. Yeah, I think we all can think back to like being in 10th grade and being able to like breathe a little bit because you're not the youngest one. You kind of know where your classes might be like all that stuff that can make you really nervous in that transition. You're like, okay, I'm past that now. Like now let's concentrate on high school. No, for sure. Yeah. Their confidence is built a little bit, maybe, maybe too much for being in 10th grade. (laughs) I know. Yeah, it is interesting. We, I think we probably had what well, freshmen always, you have the most behavior, but we had a lot of just ongoing drama with 10th grade too, I feel like. Okay. So that's kind of my next question. What kind of trends are you seeing with 10th graders? So like the drama doesn't stop from ninth grade and continues into 10th grade. Oh, yeah, it really did it. And I don't know if part of that, like we said, was kind of the maturity middle school stuff, but I ended up doing two small groups this past year and I had an intern, which was helpful. And so I was thinking back to it and almost all of my kids were ninth and 10th graders. And one of them was- When you had opened it up to everyone, but that's like who it ended up being? Yes. Okay. And part of that was just admin input. Like admin were having a lot of issues with 10th graders. Teachers were seeing a lot of issues. And then me personally, I was seeing a lot of 10th graders in my office for different issues or different things going on. But one of our small groups, we ended up calling the bad girls club, not really with them, but it was the highest behavior girls. And it was almost all 10th grade girls. And so we worked on one thing I saw with them is they just didn't have any conflict resolution skills. Mm. Their answer to everything was, we just like confront them in the hall. And I'm like, okay, okay, this is what we're working with. Yeah, that's just not going to go well, nine times out of 10. So I feel like well, and it's so interesting one. that like just changing their perspective or, you know, even the perspective of the people in the school, like these are the girls who are, quote, bad, but really yeah. they're the girls who don't have conflict resolution skills. Like that's a much nicer right. way of saying it. But from like a counselor's vernacular, like that's what you mm-hmm. see is like they don't have the coping skills that they need to have healthy relationships or friendships or be able to communicate right. what they need and <laughs> to solve conflict with other people. Yeah. Well, and it was sad too, because it ended up being kids that would come to our offices all the time because, you know, like you said, they they didn't have healthy relationships. And so there was a lot of insecurity there that manifests in different ways, but also they would constantly come because they're having an issue with this person or one week they didn't have any friends because they got in a big fight. Or the- like, what a way to put a mirror back on them and be like, hey, maybe it's you. Look, everybody yeah. in this room is having oh, this God. problem. Like, Y'all have something in yeah. common that you need to develop these skills a little bit more. That's right. That's a, a cool perspective to have as a counselor to get all those people in a room to get to work on those skills together. Yeah, it was interesting. I I won't say that it always went super smoothly because we ended up having, you know, two girls that had an issue with another one. Of or whatever, course. But in my sweet interest, but I was like, you know what? This is the place for that. Like, yep. We're going to talk it out. So, so it, it did end up being really cool. And hopefully those girls took some stuff out of it. But it, it, it did you feel like to back to our original or point, not original point, but a little bit ago that they still have so much time to work on those things. They're still mm-hmm. just in 10th grade. So what was the other topic of the small group that you did? You said you did two of them. Yeah. The other one was kind of an attendance focus. So these were kids that were missing a lot of school. And that's something else, as I was thinking kind of about 10th graders specifically, that I feel like I had a lot of 10th graders who just were missing tons of school. Mm -hmm. And part of it, I think, is that most of them can't drive. Probably like half of our kids have the economic means to have a car when they're a little bit older. But then also we have, we had a good population that just are kind of more transient or we're moving in or whatever. And so anyway, I think 
it was a combination of parents not making sure they got to school and then parents not having the means to get them to school. Mm -hmm. And when they can drive, I feel like that's a little bit different too. But anyway, it was the kids that were missing a lot. So the other big focus of that one was study skills. That's another thing I feel like my 10th graders, I was like, oh gosh. Like, like, how did you make it here? And you don't have these study skills yet. Yeah. Not only were they missing school, but we were teaching them like basic middle school things like, okay, like this is how you organize a binder. Maybe you should do different folders. This is what a planner looks like, which Mm -hmm. was really in my mind, because I've worked with middle schoolers before. These are middle school things. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have that. They missed that whole gap of middle school. So they didn't have anyone telling them this is how you do it. Yeah. And I do feel like people, some people moved more during COVID. So some of our kids Mm -hmm. in that group had been to three different middle schools and they didn't even attend in person. So they they just didn't have a chance to learn those skills. So that was a good group too, because like we said, like those skills are necessary for not only high school, but also like life (laughs) outside of that. You have to be organized in some capacity. Now, I know what I would answer to this, but I'm going to ask this because I think a listener is thinking this. How do you run a small group for attendance for kids who don't like to come to school or who are missing school a lot? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I will say one thing that we found was that for a lot of our kids, if they knew that they had something to attend, we did it on Mondays. So they knew every Monday, either second or fourth block, that they would have something and somebody was waiting for them. Mm -hmm. checking up on them, wanted them to be there. They were a lot more likely to come. And even my kids that didn't come every week, they would come find me and say, hey, Miss Fain, I'm so sorry I missed. Like this or this was going on. And I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, thank you for letting me know. It's okay, you're not in trouble. But like they they cared more. And then we did also, of course, try to do incentives. Like they had buddies, so we buddied them up. And so they were supposed to be each other's accountability partners. Mm -hmm. So they checked in the Friday before to be like, hey man, like remember we have a small group on Monday and second block. So kind of like help them. And then it was I love that because their little friendship started to develop. Yeah. Yeah. So you make the relationships like stronger in the group and mm-hmm. outside the group. I feel like the reminder, you have it like horizontally, like from a peer yeah. level, and then vertically, like an adult in the building who's looking forward to seeing them and who they know they're gonna check in with. Like that that becomes, I don't know if there's research out there that shows this, but I experienced the exact same thing. When they had something that someone was looking forward to seeing them, it's like they've just kind of been, in, sometimes, I'm not saying everyone, yeah. they've been like invisible yeah. in school sometimes yeah. where like there isn't an adult that is asking how they're doing or like noticing that they weren't there. And all of a sudden they're like, right. wow, like somebody cares and somebody notices me. Yeah. And I feel like that's such a culmination of multiple things. Like we touched on COVID. Obviously, if they're not coming in person, they aren't building those relationships. But also if they've moved a lot or even just haven't developed some of those social skills, like, and we see this with so many kids. I mean, who wants to go somewhere if you don't have any friends? Of and course. you feel alone and like a stranger. So and the opposite. If you feel like you, you belong, if someone knows your name, like you want to show up to that. That feels good. Yeah, definitely. It was cool to see. And like you said, I mean, we had one that just came like one time and there were other family issues going on, but we had one or two that would come more and more, like would miss one or two at the beginning. And then we had eight sessions. And by the time we hit four, they were there every time. Like if they were coming to school, it was on a Monday. So that is really cool to see. Yeah, And I mean, an attendance group like that, or if you're, you know, doing study skills, but you're like secretly measuring attendance too and seeing how that improves, like that is really meaningful and impactful data that you can share with an administrator or your teachers when the teachers are like, why are they missing my class? They miss all the time. It's like, but because they're here, they're coming so yes. much more and you can show yes. them like this, this was meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. That was our goal, obviously with the bad girls club to call that too, as well, because those kids, most of them weren't doing hot in classes uh, because right. of all the behavior things going along with it, but they tended to skip classes anyway. We You're like, like, it can only go up from here. Yeah, like, let's we try like, something. They're not going anyway. So we're going to take them and find them and be like, hey, we're going to do something fun in here. You know, yeah. so it's always something you can do, but we tried. The Click Collaborative is a membership for high school counselors designed to equip, encourage, and connect counselors to their greater community. 
With a professional development driven mindset, the membership hub comes loaded with 25 plus instantly accessible PD videos, completion certificates, and bonus features like templates, checklists, and counseling resources. But the best part isn't the features. It's the changes you'll see in your confidence and your counseling program. Inside, you'll find worthwhile, practical, and applicable PD that propels you to action in a community full of your people where you can grow, connect, and feel validated. Does this sound like the support you've been looking for? If so, I want to invite you to check out the Click Collaborative at clickcollab.com. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot and see if you can think of something. But have you ever tried anything with 10th graders that failed or it didn't go as well as you had hoped it would? Yeah, I feel like I'm trying to think. I feel like there was something in one of the small groups that was kind of a bust. Yeah, it could be an activity or it could be like an event that you plan and you're like, I'll never do that again. Well, so this is related, but I um, also have been in charge of a club at our school called Sources of Strength. And I think it's national. So there's probably other people. Yeah, I've heard of that. Do that. Yeah. And one of me and one of our other counselors run it. And what we found is really hard is just getting kids to remember and show up to things. And they like to do a lot of things in the cafeteria. But if you do the same things over and over again, kids won't respond slash if you just set up in the cafeteria, nobody is coming right to you. Mm-hmm. Like they're just not. And like an announcement to everyone is an announcement to no one. <laughs> like if right. it's not no pinpointed one... to the right person, they're not going to come up and just see yeah. what you're up to. Yeah. But what we found was like when when me and my coworker helped, they were not coming over there. They were like, no, thanks. I don't want to go to this table during my lunchtime. But when right. we had kids that actually helped, they would go to the tables and then all of the kids would come. Okay. Because it was like someone they respected as a peer. Yeah. So that was one thing. And then in a ten, in a more 10th grade specific, one of the small groups we did, they did kind of things that were like, okay, um, let's answer questions and then who can relate sort of things. But I think in hindsight, we did it too early. And mm. there was also some side drama going on, but they just weren't willing to share very well. Got it. And so it was like, you know, one girl would say, yeah, like I've been, I've been having a really hard time with my boyfriend or whatever. And so then we were like, okay, can anyone else relate to that? Thinking, well, duh. I mean, you know, most of these girls right. have had something and they were like, I don't know. And you they know? just like stared like, mm, it yeah. sucks to be you. Like that yeah. has never happened to me. <laughs> right. Which you're like, all right. But like, this is not I what mean, we want to do in small group. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> but Part those are great examples teenagers. of like things that you learned from it. Like, okay, we could do yeah. that activity, but maybe like, couple sessions later or even the like that's those are very low stakes things like the thing in the cafeteria is like okay we quickly realized like we're not the ones they want to come talk to it's their friends so I mean what a quick pivot and it was probably way way more meaningful and something that actually like something came out of it because of that cool for sure what opportunities do you think that counselors have to uniquely pour into 10th graders specifically like you kind of mentioned this that they still have time to make an impact like freshman year is really transitional senior year is really high stress so like what should counselors be capitalizing on with 10th graders there that maybe they don't have the opportunity with other grades I feel like one thing that I specifically want to focus on more this year with my 10th grade students is one thing I don't know obviously people working at different schools everybody has kind of different retention rates and also graduation rates But what I found is 10th grade is the make it or break it year for kids that are going to drop out or stay in school. I think so, too. I think there's all this like research that says it's ninth grade. But I think 10th grade is so huge for that. We pour all these resources into ninth grade because that's what the research says. And then we just drop off and forget about 10th graders. Yeah, because I feel like, you know, if you have a kid because they all have, well, they're supposed to come right in ninth grade for the most part because of compulsory school age being 16. But then if they have a really bad ninth grade year and they come into 10th grade and it's also going downhill and nothing seems to be helping, they're going to drop out as soon as they can. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I've had that with so many of my 10th grade students. And so one thing I want to just focus on this year specifically is taking those at-risk 10th graders that I already know, you know, I'm aware of because they had a pretty bad ninth grade year, a lot of behavior issues, whatever. They had those risk factors and just really sitting down with each of those kids individually and making a point to say, hey, this is where you're at. This is your academic plan. Let's talk about it. What are your realistic goals? What can you pass this year? Can you get back on track? Because I think a lot of those kids too, they get stuck in like a negative mindset of, Mm -hmm. well, I failed everything in ninth grade, so I'm never going to make it. And it's like, well, no, we're on a block schedule. So 
it's easier for our kids to make up credits because they get a whole credit in each semester. Mm -hmm. But kids don't think logically that way. And so I think just also focusing on those things and really hammering down the career plan kind of thing too. And that's one thing with 10th grade that we do is we do youth science which is a career assessment in 10th grade. And I think we specifically want to be better at utilizing that so that they realize that this is why it's important to actually pass these classes. It's because these are potential careers you could do and could be successful in. Yeah. So I want to say for anyone who's listening, like the start of the year comes and if you're working with all grade levels, you are like jumping into seniors because they mm-hmm. they have a lot of needs, a lot of really high pressure deadlines, all this stuff. But and I think that's how we forget about 10th graders. But you make such a good yeah. point of taking your at risk 10th graders from the very beginning of the year because they could turn something around like they could turn yeah. a bad ninth grade around in the first semester of 10th grade and it's still sure. not be too far gone. But no. If you wait the whole year or you wait till you're not busy, like you're not, right. your 10th graders are not going to hear you. They're already going to be going down that path again and staying at risk unless they hear oh, yeah. you and have a face to face conversation and see that it's possible. So I love what you yeah. said about concentrating on careers in 10th grade because they can really like see something that could be motivating to them to get them back on the right track. Yeah. And one thing too, and obviously not every school has this resource and I wish we had a lot more than we do, but we have a teacher on assignment basically who is also a graduation coach. And usually he works with 12th graders. It hasn't always worked really well because by the time he gets them, we're like, we're what are we going to do? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so one thing I want to talk to him about this year is, hey, I would really love if you specifically targeted my 10th and probably 11th graders too that are behind because not that my, I don't want my 12th graders to catch up, but it's just different. Um, yeah. And so I think just having an extra person besides me, because I have all the different grade levels, like if you do have that resource in your building or you have somebody else you can tap into your 10th grade admin, if you do that, yes. like our admin still does grade levels. So talking to my 10th grade admin and working with him really collaboratively, I think is a good thing too. Yeah. And being a tag team for both of those people and saying like, hey, I already mm-hmm. have a relationship with a student. I can tell, I can give you the list of students and yeah. where they are at what times. Like, Can you talk to them about behavior and discipline? Can you talk to them? Do your graduation coach spiel, but like start it in 10th grade and like, let's watch these kids together. I mean, you're only going to have good things happen, I feel like, by utilizing the other adults in your building. Right. I think so, too. If you had a magic wand and you could wave it and solve a problem for 10th graders, what problem would you be trying to solve? Ooh, that's a good question. Like I said, so much of it is just with the conflict stuff, back to that, specifically my girlies in 10th mm-hmm. grade, they just get so focused on that stuff. And it's the wrong thing to be focused on, but they have like a one track mind. Like mm-hmm. This is all that matters and they cannot let even like the little things go. So just, I mean, this is a weird, a kind of a weird answer, but just giving them like perspective, yeah. I think would be so helpful in that way with the conflict stuff with like, Hey, this one girl that you hate right now, you will literally not remember her name in right. 10 years. And they but don't believe that. <laughs> they, no, they're like, no, I will hate her forever. I'm like, okay. But also like the career stuff, like, hey, perspective right now, like I know that you are hating ninth lit or whatever, world lit, but this is why it matters. You have to pass this class to get your diploma mm-hmm. to do what you want to do. And I think they're just immature enough where they're lacking that. Whereas the, you know, your 11th and 12th graders are starting to see that. Yes. 10th grade, from my experience, they don't. Yes. But it's hard because like we said, they're approaching where it's like, no, this really matters. It always matters, but like it really is starting to define your high school experience. Yes. That's a great answer for like a magic wand question. Like you want to give them some perspective to say, hey, here's what matters. Listen to me. <laughs> Not like we have all the answers, but like... No. We are adults who have like, we've all done high school before. So like, we know what it's like to be in that adolescent brain and body where you think everybody's looking at you. You think everything is about you and it's very inwardly focused. And we know like psychologically, like that is true. That's how they think. But they need the perspective of somebody probably who's not their parents to tell them that. So that's like, those are good conversations to be having. And Mm -hmm. if we had a magic wand, that would be a perfect one to to help our 10th graders along in their maturity journey. Hopefully. (laughs) Okay. If you had unlimited resources, like unlimited Mm -hmm. time, money, manpower, what kind of things would you do for your 10th graders? Like 
a special event, a trip somewhere, something like comprehensive at school for them to like all learn about? Like, do you have any ideas yeah. floating around that if you could like dream it, you could do it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think one kind of a trend, I guess, that we've seen, and I'm sure everyone has seen is this push for kids to be their own bosses, be entrepreneurs. We have tons of kids that are want to start their own clothing line and like all these things that are not necessarily bad things at all, but it's like, okay, let's, we got to be realistic about something. And like, what are we doing now to get to there? They're right. like, like, they're like, I want to be a YouTube star. And you're like, do you have a YouTube gosh. channel? And they're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> we all like, know, wanna, we've all had these conversations. Yeah. Like I want to own my own business. And I'm like, okay, well maybe we should pass algebra one, you mm -hmm. know, because you do need to know math to right. run your business. So I don't know, something, and we do something called a reality fair. I'm sure other schools do something version of this too, but it's in the school gym and it, you know, it only is going to hold so much weight. So I feel like if we were able to do something that they thought was actually cool, right. Mm -hmm. That has like the status that they respect or whatever with really big, well-known companies. Cause we have a few, we actually, because we're in Atlanta, we have like some people from Delta and stuff come out, which is nice, but just something that holds weight in their eyes, mm -hmm. but that's also like, hey, you know, real people that they think are cool, that are young, hip, whatever, doing jobs that they would like to do. But also, this is how I got here. This is how I struggled. This is what I had to do to make it here. It's not all like glamour and you just float along mm -hmm. you know, online Etsy shop and then it all just works out. Because there's a real, as I'm sure you know, just from this and your podcast and everything, like it's a grind, right? It's like a nonstop struggle. And I just think, their perception of work is not always realistic or healthy for them going forward. So some kind of reality kind of thing where they would they would get to have fun, they would get to, you know, eat free Chick-fil-A because we have Chick-fil-A in Atlanta, yeah. whatever that looks like, but also have a better understanding of, hey, this is what it takes to succeed in the world and maybe make, you know, 100000 or plus more dollars. And I love that. You could, if you could dream that whole thing up and make it happen, um, I mean, you're still yeah. like, everyone would be pumped to be a 10th grader. Yeah, hopefully that would be awesome for sure. Well, Hannah, as we wrap up, tell me what is your favorite thing that you love most about working with sophomores? I think kind of what we said, like having the potential for them, like knowing there's that potential there, knowing you have more time with them. And you're able to invest and kind of talk to them so that you're they're realizing too, they can see, hey, there's a you can continue to make these decisions you're making, or you can make a few different decisions and kind of take a different path. But I think also they're still at a very interesting age because they're not ninth graders, like we said, but they're also still still pretty immature, still trying to figure out who they are. Whereas my 11th and 12th graders more, I feel like, especially by 12th grade. They kind of, they pretty much know who they are and kind of what they're about. But 10th graders are definitely, in my experience, more malleable. And so in there a little more honest, I yeah. think, too, than, you know, 17 or 18 year old. And so I, I will say, I think I get my funniest stories from my 10th graders. <laughs> they're out of control. They have no filter. Right. Like, no oh, filter, okay. but not as nervous as ninth grade. Yeah. So, but they're so like, then they they're just, on the younger side. It's so funny. Yeah. And then they, I mean, I'm like trying not to laugh. I'm like, don't laugh. This is not funny. Like it's so mean or it's so bad or whatever, but they're like, you get to know their little personalities. Right. Too. Oh, that's so good. And when you're saying like, you know, in 11th grade and 12th grade, they're more mature. I'm like, they are more mature than ninth and 10th grade. Right. Like teeny tiny bit yeah. more. It's like when I think back, I'm like, was I that much more mature in 11th oh, and 12th grade? <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think so, but I'm yeah. sure I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I think 12th grade is when you when stuff hits you more. Right, right. But, I mean, you feel well, the I won't more. say for all of them. Yeah, because <laughs> some of them I'm like, okay, I need this to hit you by April. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But yeah. Well, Hannah, thanks so much for talking to us about sophomores. This was right. really fun. And I feel like I related to you a lot about those common struggles with 10th graders when I think back to my early days working at the high school that I was at. And, and I think back to being a 10th grader. I'm like, things mm -hmm. haven't changed. This is just like, how how the world is in 10th grade, yeah. you know, maybe some different things with COVID and stuff. But when it all boils right. down, like we see some of the same trends and hopefully some listeners who hear this feel seen and heard like, oh, yes, I have funny stories from 10th grade, too. And um, maybe right. they got some good ideas from stuff that you've done in your school. Yeah, for well, sure. Well, thanks for being here. 
Yeah, thank you so much. We are more than halfway done with our grade level series. If you love this episode or this series in general, why don't you head right into your podcast app right now and leave a five-star rating and a review to go with it. I love reading reviews on the show, and it's been a hot minute since I read a new one. I'd love to do that again soon. Do you share your sophomore caseload with another counselor or two at your school? Do me a favor and just text this episode to them right now. It'll give you something to chat about with them at lunch, am I right? And the more high school counselors who share the pod, the more it can have a broader reach and impact on other high school counselors and, in turn, the students that they work with. So thanks for listening to this week's episode, and we will chat again next week about 11th graders. Thanks for listening to today's episode of High School Counseling Conversations. All the links I talked about today can be found in the show notes and also at counselorclick.com slash podcast. Be sure to hit follow wherever you listen to your podcast so that you never miss a new episode. Connect with me over on Instagram. Feel free to send me a DM at counselorclick. That's C-L-I-Q-U-E. I'll see you next week.